Hello, I'm Charlie Winterbauer, co-chair of the Southeastern chapter of the Native Plant Society. I'm pleased to present a video with Doug Tallamy, spoke in Wilmington a number of years ago. And while this is available via some link that you are accessing it, it is also available on a DVD. So if you want a copy of that to show to your, your uh, garden club or whatever, send me an email at charlie at ncwildflower.org. That's charlie, C-H-A-R-L-E-Y, at ncwildflower.org. So now let's start the video. You know, when I was, when I was in third grade, I, I uh, moved to a new development along with my family. They moved too. And the name of the development was Oak Park. This is in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. It was called Oak Park because oaks are what the bulldozers had knocked down in order to make the development. And our house was the first house to be built on a circle and then he built them from right to left. So the lot to the left of us was undeveloped for a full year after we moved in. And there was a little pond on that lot. So that was my first intense interaction with nature. I used to go to that pond every day after school and see what was happening. And in the spring, this is what was happening. Toads came and started to sing. They invited bigger toads and gave them a hug. I thought that was nice. They kept hugging them until eggs came. And then those eggs hatched into polywogs. And that's what I wanted to watch. I wanted to watch metamorphosis. I want to watch these little aquatic creatures turn into little terrestrial creatures, and they are little when they come out. Uh, and it became important to me to be at that time when those little guys first first made landfall. Um, and and it, must have, you know, it must have been a Saturday or something. I was lucky, but I was there, and out they came by the 10s and the 20s and the 30s. And it was very exciting, exciting for a little third grader. But right at that time, a bulldozer came around the corner and buried that pond. So that was the end of the little toad. It was not the end of the big toads. It was not the end of me either because I ran away. Uh, but it's not the end of the big toads because they're not at the pond when the little ones leave. But in essence, it was the end of the big toads because they had lost their breeding site. I lived there another 17 years, and I can tell you that was local extinction for that population of toads in that corner of Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. It was local extinction for the garter snakes that ate the toads. It was local extinction for everything associated with the food web that was once attached to that little pond. And the problem, of course, is that that has happened so many times since then and so many places since then that we literally are losing the plants and animals we share the planet with. I wish we shared the planet as well as these two birds are sharing a sycamore in my backyard. Um, but we haven't for two reasons. The first reason is that we haven't thought we needed to. We thought we could develop spaces anywhere, and there would always be a lot of nature left someplace else. And the reason we thought that is that that's been true through most of our history. There weren't all that many humans and we could develop spaces and there was a lot of nature left someplace else. Um, that's not true anymore. Though. The, the uh, human footprint on this planet is absolutely enormous now. It's bigger than, than almost any of us can imagine. And there are very few places where nature is happy anymore. The second reason why we haven't shared the planet well is that um, we truly don't believe that we need other living species, species around for our own well-being. You know, we give it lip service, but deep down inside, we don't take it very seriously. We couldn't possibly take it seriously uh, because of the way we're, we're treating other species. When you think about it, though, when we develop living spaces for ourselves that don't support life, that could be a clear signal that our own life support systems uh, are either in trouble now or will be shortly. Uh, and that's something we've got to be proactive about. We can't wait until our life support systems fail and then decide to do something about it. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about why we do need other living things to keep those life support systems going. Why do we need biodiversity? Why do we need to, to change the way we landscape in order to save nature, in order to save biodiversity? Why does animal diversity depend on native plants, not plants that evolved in China or Europe, but plants that evolved someplace or, or right here? And then finally, we'll talk about how to make our landscapes sustainable. I used to have the word more in there, how to make our landscapes more sustainable. And so I thought about what the word sustainable means. Sustainable is, is being sustainable is like being pregnant. You either are or you aren't. And right now our landscapes are not sustainable. I can say that because to me sustainability means if you're not sustaining life, how can you possibly be sustainable? And in so many cases our landscapes are not sustaining life. So that's a lot to talk about. Let's get started. First of the definition, what is biodiversity? Um, 
there's actually several definitions for biodiversity. We've got genetic diversity, we've got population diversity, we have, we have ecosystem diversity. Those are all good things, but most people think about biodiversity uh, in terms of species, species diversity. And we have a lot of species on the planet uh, at this point, about 420,000 species of plants, over 4 million species of insects. There are fewer species of vertebrates, but still a lot of them, about 31,000 species of fish, 15,000 species of reptiles and amphibians, even fewer mammals, about 5,400 species of mammals, a third of which are already endangered, like these little white tent bats from Central America. Then we've got about 9,700 species of birds. Then each one of these species has a particular role in its ecosystem, and if you have a healthy ecosystem, you have what we call redundancy. We have several species doing the same job. The good thing about redundancy is that it's a, it's a backup system. It's like a backup quarterback. If one of those species disappears, the others are there to fill in the gap, and the ecosystem service that they are performing is still performed. The problem comes, though, when we simplify ecosystems to the point where there's only one or maybe two species doing a particular job. And if they disappear, the job is not done, and you start to get ecosystem failure. So why do we need biodiversity? That's the main reason. It is biodiversity, it is nature, it is other living things that run our ecosystems. We can be selfish about it. We'll call them our ecosystems because we need them. If you've got a diverse ecosystem, it's more stable, it's more productive, meaning it makes more of those ecosystem services that we need. It's less susceptible to invasion by alien organisms. We certainly have enough of those running around these days. And again, those are, those are good things. So try to think of the plants and the animals around you as the rivets that hold your lives together, that hold your ecosystems together, that hold your environment together. Don't think about it as the environment, as if it's something separate that you can do without. It's not. And don't, please don't forget that that is what sustains you. It is not the mall that sustains you. Maybe it is the mall that sustains you, but everything that's in the mall comes from a healthy ecosystem. And that's a message we have not gotten across very well. Now, way back in 1949, a man by the name of Aldo Leopold wrote uh, Sand County, County Almanac, which is now a very important book in the world of conservation. And this is the first line of that book. He said that there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. But I disagree with that first line because I'm going to argue that there is nobody who can live without wild things. You may not like wild things, but everybody needs them because it is those wild things that run the ecosystems that everybody needs. And that's because of those ecosystem services I keep talking about. What's an ecosystem service? It's all the things we take for granted every day like the production of oxygen. Now, how many people woke up this morning and wondered whether you have enough oxygen this afternoon? I forget to do that every day, too. But of course, it's plants that make oxygen. We don't, we don't do that because oxygen's always been here. At least we think it's always been here. But it hasn't always been here. There was no oxygen before we had plants. And if we get rid of the plants, there will be no oxygen again. We have already removed half of the plants on the planet, half of the forests, I should say, on the planet. In, in the year, the international year of, of forests, we have removed half of them. And we're continuing to chip away at, at the other half. Uh, and some of you will say, well, you know, we're getting most of our, most of our oxygen from the, the algae that's in the ocean. Uh, and that's largely true. But look at what we're doing to our ocean. Either way, we need to keep the plants around. We need to keep plants around because plants clean our water, a very important ecosystem service. Plants build our topsoil and they hold it in place, keep it from eroding away. Plants prevent floods, something that we might want to think about. Uh, as a matter of fact, plants, very complex uh, plant communities, moderate weather systems all over the planet. You don't have events that look like that when you have diverse ecosystems that are intact. It's other species that recycle our garbage, that pollinate those plants. 80% of our plants are pollinated by animals, not by the wind. And of course, it's plants that sequester carbon dioxide, sequester carbon. This is a ceiba tree in the forest of Costa Rica. 16 people right there. You can tell this is a big tree. Still very healthy. At 600 years old, we measured it that day. It hadn't been measured in 10 years, and we measured the circumference. It had grown a meter in the last 10 years. So it's still actively sequestering carbon. And of course, it's pulling the carbon out of the air tying it up in its tissues, and it will hold that carbon out of harm's way until it dies and slowly releases it. 
And we hear all the time that trees are not a permanent solution to our carbon waste. I agree, but I'll take a 600 year solution any day. We should be putting trees like that, slow growing, dense trees that are going to hold carbon for a long time on the planet as fast as possible. It's cheap, it's easy. We are still removing 50,000 acres of forest every day. You might think, well, that everybody else is doing that because everybody else is doing that, but we are doing that too. This is the plan in the US for the next 50 years. We're slated to develop another 75 million acres of forest land, not farmland where the trees are already gone, but forest land. And that 75 million acres, by the way, is 19 times the size of New Jersey. If we do that, that will release 5.4 billion additional tons of carbon into the air, which is the same as putting another 100 million cars on the road. I contend that we can develop without taking those trees down. And you might want to think about that. Okay, carbon sequestration, another important ecosystem service. Here's one that, that we're just starting to think about, um, that we actually need to interact with those other living things on this planet for our own mental health and well-being. And this message is coming from Richard Liu, who wrote Last Child in the Woods, a book in which he coined the term nature deficit disorder. He says our kids are not out playing in nature anymore, not the way they used to. At the same time, they're suffering from elevated levels of ADHD and childhood obesity and childhood depression, he said, maybe there's a link. Let's do some research and see if there's a link. Okay, I agree with that. What, what are our kids doing? You know, whatever it is, it's electronic. We know that. Well, Richard Liv also says that our kids are the future stewards of the planet. And we don't have to do any research to see that that's true. And he says, if they don't develop an emotional relationship with the things they're supposed to be stewarding, they're going to be lousy stewards. Richard Lou says, let's get the kids out of the house, let them run out in the backyard, turn over the rock and play with the salamander. And I couldn't agree more. And the problem today, though, is that in so many places, we have sterilized our nature, our, our neighborhoods, to the point where nature is gone. They can run out of the house, turn over the rock, if there is a rock, and there will be no salamander. As a matter of fact, we've gone beyond that. We have demonized nature. Now our kids are afraid to go out of the house because something evil will happen to them. Well, we can turn that around. We can put nature back into the lives of our kids, back into our own lives, if we understand where it comes from and how to manipulate it. So where does animal diversity come from? Well, it comes from plants. And the more plants you have, the more animals you have. It's that simple. It's because of this relationship, which is not simple at all. We call it photosynthesis, but it's, it's certainly one of the major miracles of, of life. Plants are the only major group of organisms on the planet that allow us to eat sunlight. And they do that by capturing the energy from sunlight, combining it with carbon dioxide from the air, water from the ground, producing the oxygen that we all still need. And now the energy from the sun is tied up in the carbon bonds of simple sugars and carbohydrates, which happens to be the basis of every food web on this planet, with the minor exception of some sulfur-based food webs at the bottom of the ocean. But I don't want to have to depend on them for my food. So let's just Let's just generalize and say plants are making all the food. Plants also have physical structure, which means they're providing much of the housing for animals that are out there. So if you've got plants providing the food and shelter for animal life, you can look at the amount of plant life in a given space and estimate what the carrying capacity of that space is. What's carrying capacity? Well, that's just an ecological term uh, that, again, is an estimate of the amount of life that can persist in a particular place. Persist sustainably. That means it can it can persist forever because it's not degrading the resources of that particular area. And this is how it works. Let's say we have this many plants determining what the carrying capacity is in a particular area. I like to think of carrying capacity as if it were the principle in an ecological savings account. So remember when we used to have savings accounts? They used to generate interest, and we could live off that interest forever as long as we didn't dip into the principle. That's exactly what's happening here. We've got plants making ecological interest in the form of food and shelter, and animal life can grow and live off that food and shelter forever as long as we don't reduce the amount of plant life. If we do reduce the amount of plant life, we have less ecological interest produced, and any animal population using that food and shelter will crash down below the new carrying capacity. That's how carrying capacity works. This is an eastern deciduous forest. 
very high carrying capacity because it's making so much food and so much shelter compared to a suburban lawn. For obvious reasons, we have taken the plants out of this space. Now it's true that's a plant and that's a plant, but it's a tiny fraction of the plant life that used to be there. It's a tiny fraction of the ecological interest that used to be generated in that space, which means it's just a tiny fraction of the animal life in that particular area compared to what used to be there. If this were the only suburban lawn in North America, we would not have a problem. But that forces us to ask the question, what have we done to the carrying capacity of the U.S.? And I like this picture because uh, to me it really says it all. This is Manhattan Island. That's what it looked like 400 years ago, but it sustainably supported a population of 600 humans. Very high carrying capacity because all the plants were there compared to what it looks like today when all the plants are gone. Now there are a few plants in Central Park. People who live in Manhattan get upset at me when I generalize like this, but let's face it, not too many plants left. Um, so the carrying capacity is essentially zero in Manhattan. Yet, we've got 8 million people living in and around the, the, the general metropolitan area. How can you have 8 million people living in, an, in a space where the carrying capacity is zero? Uh, you can do that because ecosystem services move around. Resources move around. The people in Manhattan are getting their oxygen from all over the world. They're getting their food from all over the world. They're getting their water from the Catskill. They're sending their garbage to New Jersey. It works for the people in Manhattan as long as there are functioning ecosystems someplace else to generate the ecosystem services they need. And that is true for every major city on this planet. So it would behoove us to keep those other ecosystems, those functioning ecosystems functioning. We cannot pave them over and still have the people of Manhattan remaining happy. This is what the distribution of the virgin forest in the U.S. looked like in 1620. This area in the east here was 950 million acres of virgin forest. And that's how much virgin forest was left in 1920. And that, of course, is because we were an agrarian society. When, when European settlers came, um, we chopped down this forest so we could grow our crops. Now, fortunately, we didn't do it all at once. We did it from east to west. And as we were moving from east to west, we had the Industrial Revolution. And many people moved off the farm. And many of those forests grew back. They grew back in the form of uh, what we call secondary growth. And that, of course, is what we see all around us now. All of the forests we see is, is secondary growth. Uh, and those are good places to live. Many of these trees are over 100 years old, but we haven't stopped growing. We're still adding 5,700 people to the U.S. every day, and those people need a place to live, something to eat. So we are sprawling to provide those things for those people. Uh, and the result of that, of course, is that we are fragmenting the secondary forest that has regrown. So now, when I fly home tomorrow, I will look down and that's what I will see. Little teeny habitat patches of the eastern deciduous biome that used to be blanketing the east. The question now is, can the biodiversity that we absolutely need to sustain our ecosystem be sustained in these little habitat zones? It's not just eastern forests we're talking about. There's only 1% of the original prairie ecosystem left. You can move from ecosystem to ecosystem across the U.S. and uh, there's not a whole lot left. We've got about 129 million homes in the U.S. When you turn the lights on at night, this is what you see. I live right there, which is why I get awfully excited about this. Um, we're down here. I don't know. You're certainly doing I flew over here. You guys look pretty good compared to where I come from. Uh, but connecting all of these lighted up spaces, of course, are roads. We have 4 million miles of paved roads in the U.S. And if you calculate the road surface area, that's equal to... to uh, five times the size of New Jersey that's paved over. If this were a functioning ecosystem, that would be okay, but it's not. And of course, we have a love affair with the lawn. 45.6 million acres of lawn is the last figure I saw. We're adding 500 square miles of lawn to the U.S. every year. That's over eight times the size of New Jersey that now looks like that. Again, if that were a functioning ecosystem that was maintaining all the biodiversity we need, we wouldn't have a problem, but it's not. So we're talking about human-dominated ecosystems from coast to coast. 
41% of the U.S. is in some form of agriculture. Looks like that over Michigan, looks like that over Oregon, looks like that over much of the West. All those empty spaces you see when you fly over to, to California, there's a cow on every acre. And 54% is in what I call the, the um, urban-suburban matrix. It's this matrix of cities and suburbs, and embedded in that matrix are these little habitat patches, those patches of green that Charlie was talking about. The question is, are those patches of green big enough to maintain and sustain the biodiversity that we need? This is the uh, light pollution map of the U.S., so you get a good idea of where that 54% uh, actually is. Uh, so at least 5% of the U.S. is relatively pristine, but most of those areas are either too high, like Mount Hood here in Oregon, or too dry to support the biodiversity that we need, which is why we haven't taken them for our own use. We have converted the natural world into the cities and suburbs and agriculture that we need to maintain our current population and our current lifestyle. And I'm not here to, to make a value judgment on that, that population or, or lifestyle. I'm not here to suggest that we shouldn't do this, because we already have done this. I am here to make a value judgment about what it looks like, though. It does not have to look like that. This space was developed for the convenience of this homeowner. It was developed for the aesthetic uh, values of this homeowner. But it was not developed with the idea of sharing that space with any other living thing. But it could have been. And I would argue that if it had been, this homeowner's life would be enriched. So before we talk about um, how, well, actually, before we talk about that, I, I just want to emphasize, I'm not, try, I'm not suggesting that humans disappear from the planet. I'm not going to get very far with that one. Um, I am suggesting that we absolutely need to share the spaces that we have taken with other living things, or we just may disappear. What is happening to those other living things? Um, well, the folks at the State Natural Heritage Centers all over the country are busy measuring the conservation status of every species of plant and animal in the U.S. We have 200,000 species of plants and animals. They've only looked at one-eighth of them so far, and out of the one-eighth, they have found 4,252 4, to be imperiled. What does imperiled mean? These are on the brink of extinction. They're now so few in numbers that they're no longer performing their roles in their ecosystems. You can still go out and find one here and there but they're not common enough to be performing their role. So they're functionally extinct. That 4,252 is based on one eighth of the 200,000 species. If that pattern holds when they look at all 200,000 species, they could be as many as 33,000 species of plants and animals ready to disappear. I call that an extinction crisis. It's not one you've heard anything about recently. We talk about, we talk about lots of things but we don't talk about this extinction crisis as if it doesn't exist or as if it's not important. You know more about birds and other, other groups because we've got more birders out there measuring birds, many, many people like you. And one of the things that, that uh, birders do is a breeding bird survey. They've been doing since 1966. And what you're looking at are, are data for uh, populations of neotropical migrants along the Mississippi Flyway and the Atlantic Flyway from 66 to 2005. You can see the Mississippi Flyway is doing better than the Atlantic Flyway, but neither flyway is headed in the right direction. So from these surveys, we now know that, that uh, birds that used to be common, like the wood thrush, have lost almost 50% of their population. Bobo-winged warbler has lost 66% of its population. Cerulean warbler has lost 84% of its population. I could do this all night, because 127 species of neotropical migrants are in steep decline. It's just a reminder that, that biodiversity is disappearing. Yet biodiversity is an essential, I'm going to argue that it's an essential, non-renewable natural resource. It's essential because we humans absolutely need it for our own well-being. It's non-renewable because when these species disappear, they are not coming back. I wish we could view it as a natural resource, just as important as our air or our water or anything else that we depend on. We are forcing it to extinction. It's not our plan. There's nobody that wakes up and says, I'm going to make a species go extinct today. As a matter of fact, we have, we have set aside parks and preserves, and one of their mandates is to make sure that these species stick around. But they're not working, and we can't fix them until we understand why they're not working. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. I'm just going to talk about one of them, and that is that uh, they are essentially too small. When you take a large area and you shrink it down to a small area, 
You take large populations and you shrink them down to small or tiny populations, and that's the problem. Tiny populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why is that? Well, all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. Bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals to keep you going. But if you're a tiny population in your down cycle, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat pack. And that's what's happening. Plants and animals are, are disappearing from their little habitat patches all over the country. We know this from a number of, of uh, studies, many of them long term, some of them almost 100 years long. They're all saying the same thing. Our natural areas that we have left are not large enough to sustain the nature that we need them to sustain. Okay, that is a lot of bad news, so I'm going to have a drink. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about the good news. The good news is um, that I believe we have the ability to turn this around. Not 100%, but, but we have a, the, the potential, the, the know-how to save most of these species. If we do what I suggested before, share the spaces that we're now using for living, for working, and for farming. Let's just talk about where we live today. I'm going to call it suburbia, but it could be, it could be a city. Um, although, the, the, admittedly, you know, when we pave everything over, there is less opportunity in a city than there is in our, our suburban neighborhood. What we need to do is raise the carrying capacity of our, our yard, and we know how to do that. We raise the carrying capacity by putting plants back into these spaces, and if we, if we put enough plants back, we can recreate functioning ecosystems. So is that all we have to do, just add plants? Well, remember why we're adding plants. We are adding plants because they are the first trophic level. They are the, the group of organisms that, that, that supply the food for all the food webs. And unfortunately, not all plants are equal in their ability to support food webs. So that means we've got to add the right plants. Here's an example. This is Autumnala Venus Iliagnus. I uh, went to Charlotte a couple of years ago, and they told me that it's not Iliagnus, it's Ugly Agnus. Plant that evolved in Asia was brought over here as, a, as an ornamental about 100 years ago. Escape is now a major invasive species uh, everywhere we, we look. Um, and it is displacing native plants. Typically, we disturb an area, ugly agnus comes in first and then prevents native plants from, from uh, recolonizing. But in the end, you have a lot of ugly agnus and very few native plants. If ugly agnus was the ecological equivalent of the plants that it's displacing, then everything would be okay. Our ecosystems would look different, but they still would function in the same way. But that's not the case. It's not the case, particularly in their ability to support food webs. How do I know that? Because ugly agnus and other non-native plants are very poor at supporting local insects. How do we know that? Well, that's what my research is about at the University of Delaware. Uh, and I'll just give you some results here to support what I'm saying. You're looking at the abundance of caterpillars um, that, that we're studying in a large common garden, garden experiment. We're, uh, we're still wrapping up, but um, this is a, a big one. Hundreds of thousands of insects measured on these, these native and non-native plants. Um, so these are the caterpillars. We found a lot more caterpillars on the native plants than on the non-native plants. And this is how they were separated into generalists and specialists. We found a lot more species of caterpillars on the native plants. Which means when you take native plant communities away and replace them with plants from someplace else, you have fewer caterpillars. Does that matter? Well, it matters if you're a bird trying to eat those caterpillars or trying to feed them to your young. If you're this common yellow throat and you're in a habitat where there's five times fewer caterpillars because it's been overrun with non-native plants, you're going to have to forage five times harder to get the same amount of food for your offspring. Can you do that? No, you can't. You're already foraging all day long, 156 trips a day, one trip every five minutes. You can't do that five times harder. So the prediction is that you will have five times less bird biomass in an area where you remove the food. This is not rocket science. Birds need to eat. What's happening in our yard? This is a data set uh, of ornamental plants that we plant right in suburbia. And we generated this by looking at the plants that are recommended by Michael Burr's manual for, for woody landscape plants. He says we should landscape with 69 genera of, of alien plants and 101 genera of native plants. And what we did was go through the literature and look up the number of species of caterpillars 
that could make a living on each one of these plants. The reason we focus on caterpillars uh, is there are two reasons. First of all, they're uh, among the favorite foods of, of birds, particularly woodlers, um, a disproportionately important food source for our birds. And secondly, we get better records of what caterpillars eat compared to other herbivorous insects. And this is what we found. On average, four species of caterpillars could be supported by the alien ornamentals that we put in our yards, and 72 species could be supported by the native ornamentals that we put in our yards. So when we, when we landscape with crepe myrtle and other favorite non-natives, we lose a tremendous amount of insect diversity. Why can't insects eat alien plants? Most people think insects can eat any plant. And if you see them eating any plant, you have to kill them right away. Because that's what we've been taught. I mean, we all grew up eating that. Uh, but that's an urban legend. Insects are actually very fussy about what they can eat because plants have made them fussy. Because plants don't want to be eaten. Plants want to capture that energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So what they've done is load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals secondary metabolic compounds that are either bitter or downright toxic to discourage those insects from eating the leaves. And it's, it's a very successful uh, defensive strategy. If you don't believe me, when you go to your car tonight, grab a leaf. I don't care what it is, grab it and eat it and see if you like it. You're not going to like it. This strategy has kept most herbivores on the planet from eating most of the plants. Which is why when we look out there, we see that it's green. Most of those leaves are not eaten because most of them are inedible. Yet insects do eat plants. So how do they do this? How do they get around the defenses of these plants? <clears throat> well, we do it by specializing. If I'm in an insect lineage, I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose one particular type of chemical defense, one class of defensive chemicals, and I'm going to develop the physiological ability to get around that. I'm going to develop the enzymes and the behavior and the life history adaptations that allow me to eat that plant without dying. But in order to do that, it's going to take a long evolutionary exposure to that particular plant lineage that's making that particular defensive compound. And through time, you've got the plant making a, a, a more uh, intense defense and the insect responding to it. And they do this little evolutionary dance through time uh, until they get to the point where everything is in balance. The monarch butterfly is a perfect example of this. It, of course, is a specialist on milkweed. The only thing they eat, but what they're really specializing on are these cardiac glycosides that are in milkweed. This is the nasty tasting chemicals that, that make milkweeds uh, distasteful and, and actually downright toxic. When you're pulling leaves to eat, don't eat a milkweed leaf because cardiac glycosides will stop your heart. It doesn't stop the heart of the monarch, and they do have a heart by the way, uh, because of those adaptations that they have. They know how to, to sequester and, and secrete and detoxify those nasties so that now they can eat, they can eat that, that uh, noxious plant without dying. And that's the upside of specializing. The monarch can eat a plant that is toxic to almost everything else, which means it has very little competition now when it's, when it's developing. And it works great for the monarch as long as there is a patch of milkweed nearby. But when we landscape in a way that pulls out the patches of milkweed and replaces them with petunias or something else, the monarch has no other choice but to disappear. It cannot crawl off and start to eat asters or start to eat grass or start to eat oak trees. That's the downside of specializing. When you specialize on one particular plant lineage, you lose the ability to eat anything else. This is the double tooth prominent. It's a caterpillar that only eats elm. Um, not only is it good at, at getting around the, the chemical defenses of the elm, it's good at looking like the edge of an elm leaf. Why does it want to do that? Well, you've got all these birds out there that are trying to, to eat caterpillars. And you might think birds hunt caterpillars, but they don't. They hunt caterpillar damage. They're looking for holes in the leaf. And when they find a hole in a leaf, then they circle around it and try to find the caterpillar that made that hole. So you see this guy's game plan here. He's sitting in the area that he has just eaten, and he says, there's no holes here. <laughs> and he hopes that the bird flies on. It works great for the double tooth prominent, as long as there's elm around. But if the Dutch elm disease comes and takes out all our elm trees, the double tooth prominent will disappear. That's all it can eat. It's not just caterpillars that are specialists. This is the elderberry beetle. Only eats elderberry. 
dog vein beetle only eats dog vein. This is a leaf footed bug, a Korean bug that only eats ash trees. So if the emerald ash borer comes and takes out all our ash trees, this guy's going to disappear. And that's the problem. 90% of the insect herbivores that are out there are specialists, just like the ones I just showed you. So again, if we remove the native plant communities that support these insects, we're going to lose 90% of the insects that eat plants. Who cares? Typically, it's not gardeners who care. A world where that insects is what they have been looking for. And you know what? We have been, we've been amazingly successful. We have bought plants labeled pest-free, meaning nothing can eat them for the last century. We have loaded tens of thousands of square miles of suburbia with these plants. And if any insect does come, we sprayed it. And we've been really successful at creating a land without insects. So it's not going to be gardeners who care. Um, who cares, though, are the things that eat insects. And it turns out it's an awful lot of creatures. Like spiders. Our spiders eat insects. Or they eat other spiders that eat insects. Again, gardeners might say, well, I don't like spiders either. But these are really important parts of the food web. Other insects eat insects. Frogs eat insects. Toads eat insects. All of the amphibians eat insects. Lizards eat insects, bats eat insects, even our rodents eat insects. They eat a lot of insects. We typically think of rodents as seed eaters, and they do eat seeds when they can't find insects. The reason they, they like insects so much is that insects are really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in, in beef. And insects have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies, just like me. They're filled with lipids that supply a, a tremendous amount of energy for these, these little guys. It allows them to grow very quickly. And if you're a mouse, you've got to grow quickly because there's a lot of things that are trying to, to eat you. But it's the same reason that larger organisms are eating insects. They're just really good food. The skunk is digging up your lawn to get the grubs that are in your lawn. Possums eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like foxes, like black bears. 23% of, of a black bear's diet is insects. That's a striped chin hawk. Do they eat insects? No. It's a bird predator. Eat other birds. So there you go. You can say, well, we can, we can get rid of the insects in suburbia and we'll still have striped chin hawks. Uh, but no, we won't. Because the bird that the striped chin hawk is eating needed insects to become birds. These guys don't rely on insects directly, but they rely on them indirectly. Same thing with the garter snake. We cannot, they, they don't eat insects, they eat the frogs and the toads. That ate the insects. So we cannot take insects out of these food webs without those food webs collapsing. This, of course, is, is the group that needs insects as much as anything. This is the group that's supposed to tug in your heartstrings. It's our baby birds. And that's a list of the terrestrial bird families in North America that rear their young on insects. Or the book will say insects and other arthropods. And the other arthropods are those spiders that needed insects to become spiders. This is 96% of our terrestrial birds rely on insects when they're making more birds. We are so used to thinking of birds as berry eaters and seed eaters, which some of them are in certain times of their life history. But when they're making more birds, which happens to be an important time, they eat insects. So I can generalize and say that this, this brown thrasher is not going to be able to rear its offspring through the maturity if it's in land without enough insects. And that is such a land. Now we did a survey this summer looking at what the, the, the starting point would be in suburbia if we actually decide to change the way it looks. Uh, we focused on, on what I call sprawl neighborhoods, neighborhoods built between 1992 and 2005. Uh, this is Delaware, uh, southeast uh, Pennsylvania. I live right there in Maryland. And each little teardrop is a development uh, built by a different developer. We chose three houses randomly from each development, and we measured everything we could about the landscape in those spaces. The first thing we found is that 92% of the landscape area was lawn. 92%. So there weren't many plants out there. The plants that were there, 74% of the species were non-native, 79% of the individual plants were non-native, and 9% were, were highly invasive. Not because they had invaded these territories, but because the homeowner had planted them. We also compared the amount of tree biomass in these suburban neighborhoods with tree biomass in a nearby woodlot. And essentially what we found is that only about 10% of the tree biomass remains in suburbia. Now, if you've got trees making the food that support our birds, we have just removed 90% of the food, which explains
explains why when you look out your window, you don't see much. If I took away 90% of your food, you wouldn't stick around. So let's start to think about our lawns in terms of the ecosystem services that they can do for us. Most people think of, you know, they know what an ecosystem service is, but they're, they're relying on some other place to do it. If we want to make clean water, we can't have 92% of the area lawn. Lawn makes dirty water. It also does not hold the water um, on the land uh, or allow it to, to infiltrate. If we want to sequester carbon dioxide, we need more than 10% of the trees that ought to be there. If we want to save biodiversity, we've got to landscape with plants that come from within our local food web. That's what native means, from within your local food web. This is my neighbor's house. He is at one end of the landscaping spectrum because 100% of his plants are non-native. This is, this is burning bush, highly invasive up where we, we uh, come from. He's got 34 Bradford pears. He has 10 acres. He has 10 acres. So this is, most of it, which you can't see here, is lawn. Uh, but it's not a small impact on the land. What's interesting about my neighbor, though, is that I think he's typical of most homeowners. He doesn't know anything about plants. He doesn't care about plants. He didn't plant any of these plants. What he did was hire a landscaper. And this is what he got. And he's perfectly happy with what, what he got. Because he had one goal. His goal was to fit in with the neighbors. Except I didn't count. And he achieved that goal. He looks just like everybody else, believe me. Uh, so he's happy. But should we be upset with the landscaper that gave my neighbor a 100% alien landscape? Well, maybe in a few years. But remember, that's what the landscaper was trained to do, too. So until we re-educate the landscaping industry, let's, let's cut them a break. Um, because the landscaping industry, of course, has grown out of the horticulture industry, and horticulturists are artists, and their job is to paint the landscape with beautiful plants. And if they use plants from all over the world, they have a bigger palette to work with. That has been the thinking. We have reduced the value of plants to, to mere decoration. We've forgotten all those important ecological services they're providing. Now they're just decorations. And if we look in a landscaping magazine, that's what our backyard is supposed to look like. Aesthetically, it works. Ecologically, it's a disaster. You know, if you're, if you're landscaping for a sense of place, the sense of place here is Beijing. Because all these plants are from Asia, except the cool season European, European grass. So all we need to do, we don't have to throw out the horticulture industry or throw out the notion that plants should be beautiful. We just have to add a notion that plants do something, and we've got to pay attention to their, to, to the, the ecological function that these species do as well. You know, if we're, if we're talking about sense of place, um, we inadvertently did a, a little experiment last June. My wife and I drove from Oxford, Pennsylvania to Portland, Oregon. We were delivering a car for a friend, and every time I pulled off to get gas, uh, I stopped and took a, a picture of the nearest development. If we were landscaping for a sense of place, if we were celebrating our natural heritage, I would have been able to recognize where we were every time we did this. Because we drove through something like eight different biomes. A biome, of course, is a, is a ecological collection of plants that are distinct for that latitude, that altitude, that soil type, that rainfall. And a good botanist, a good ecologist can recognize the community of plants in particular biomes anywhere in the country and, and recognize where he or she is. So where am I? Then? This is the, the Douglas fir uh, cedar, yellow cedar uh, climax forest from Portland, Oregon. This is the High Plains Prairie of Bozeman, Montana. This is the Eastern Deciduous Forest of, of Oxford, Pennsylvania. That's the Mixed Deciduous Forest of Belvedere, Illinois. Obviously, we are not celebrating our, our, our sense of place or, or our natural heritage. We're celebrating our ability to fit in with the neighbors, and we're really good at it. Anywhere in the country, you can look at our land. We've chosen a few landscape plants. They're all the same, and we fit in very well. There are some downsides to landscaping with plants from someplace else. I'm not going to talk about the diseases that we have brought in with these plants. I'm not going to mention the chestnut blight that eliminated chestnuts up and down the east coast, a major forest tree, so that we could see what Japanese chestnuts look like in our front lawn. I'm not going to mention that. I am going to talk about the fact that when you plant these plants, um, very often they don't stay where you plant them. You know, people, I, 
people scratch their head and say, I put that bush there 10 years ago. It's still there. Of course, I'm pointing you back to seeds. The property dealers in these things, they move. What you're looking at here is Fairhill Preserve. In Fairhill, Maryland, I drive by it on the way to work every day when I go to work. Uh, and it is a period in the spring of a week or a week and a half where plants from Asia leap out before plants from North America. And that's what you're looking at here. That's a very convenient time to look at in your natural areas. And you can figure out what is native and what is not. Because all the stuff that's green during that period shouldn't be there. And that's what you're seeing here. you got a lot of green, a lot of plants, but none of them belong there. All of our favorites are here. We've got multiflora rose, we've got ugly agnes, we've got privet, we've got armor honeysuckle, we've got Japanese honeysuckle, we've got miscanthus, we've got oriental bittersweet, we've got Norway maple, we've got Atlantis, and many more. They're all there, and every one of them is an escapee from our garden. This is Cape May, New Jersey. You birders know Cape May, important stopover point for migrating birds. What are they stopping for? They're stopping to eat. Why are they migrating? Because they're insectivores. They need insects, and the insects disappear in the wintertime. This, those are sweet gum trees. They don't look like sweet gum trees because they're covered with porcelain berry, and they're escaping from our garden. If you pull the porcelain berry off those sweet gum trees, they're dead. That's the end of secondary succession in that corner of, of Cape May, New Jersey. So now the birds have to get their food from porcelain berries. And I wish them luck. And that's the problem. 85% of our, our woody invasive plants in this country that we are spending billions of dollars trying to control on the one hand, 85% are escapees from our garden. We're spending billions of dollars trying to control them on the one hand. On the other hand, we're selling them in our nurseries. This is just a partial list of important ornamental plants that are now serious invasive. And I show it to you to prove one point. There is something we call lag, a lag time, a period during which uh, plants behave themselves and then all of a sudden they become invasive. Japanese honeysuckle is a perfect example. It was sold in the ornamental trade for 80 years before it escaped. For 80 years it behaved itself. For 80 years a nurseryman could have said, this is not an invasive species. And he probably would have said, so it's okay. That ignores the food web. But for 80 years it did behave itself, and then all of a sudden it didn't. And then it wasn't in the, in the nursery trade anymore because everybody already owned it. It had, it had become the dominant plant up and down the East Coast. It's, if you look at the understory at my house, it is Japanese honeysuckle. The one thing we struggled with unsuccessfully. And all of these plants have flag time as well. So when we sell plants in nurseries today and argue these plants are not invasive, I just think they're not invasive yet. Now it's true, some of them won't, be become, won't become invasive. The problem is we can't predict which ones will and which ones won't. So whenever we're selling a plant from someplace else, unless it is sterile, we're taking a risk. My point here is, is very simple. If we're going to restore the ecological integrity of this suburban space here, it's not just the amount of plants we need to think about. We certainly do have to get more plants back into that space. But the type of plant that we're putting in that space is also very important. So you might think, all right, all we have to do is plant native plants, and we're all set. But it turns out that all native plants are not equal in their ability to support food webs either. We know this because of this list. We generated this list in, in, in my lab. Um, it's a list of all of the woody plant genera in the mid-Atlantic states, and the little numbers after each plant genus is the number of species of caterpillars, the number of species of bird food that it can support. So you've got all the natives there and also the non-natives that are, that are now naturalized. So memorize that. Okay, what are we going to do with this list? Now we can pick any two plant genera and compare them in terms of their uh, their their um, ability to support food webs. So let's do that. Let's compare tulip tree, Liria dendron tulipifera, really important forest tree where I come from uh, in terms of, of dominance. We have a number of, of woodlots that are almost 100% tulip tree compared to one of the oaks. We go to our list and we see oaks are number one. The genus Quercus, 534 species of caterpillars, 534 species of bird food on oaks compared to 21 species on tulip trees. I'm not trying to get a, a monoculture of anything here, but if you have a space in, in your yard 
for one trade, and you're trying to determine which is the one you want to put there, if you want to help biodiversity the most, would you pick an oak or would you pick a tulip tree? If you're managing the woodlot and you find out there's 100% tulip tree, would you try to get some diversity of some higher producing plants into that woodlot? That's what this list is for. What about a red bud? That's a very important native plant. It's pushed by the native plant industry because it's beautiful. What's its wildlife value compared to black cherry? which typically is not in the native plant industry at all, for a couple of reasons. Landscapers don't like it. They don't like it because they say it's messy, meaning it makes more black cherries, and because it gets tent caterpillars, meaning it supports biodiversity. If you hire a landscaper like my neighbor did, the first thing they do is they cut all of your black cherries off your property and tell you they're weeds. But remember what a weed is. A weed is a plant out of place. And believe me, your black cherries are not out of place. They belong there. Well, let's go to our list. They're in the genus Prunus, of course, and that's number two on our list. 456 species on Prunus compared to red bud supports 19. Again, both native plants, but there's a tremendous difference in their ability to support wildlife. I am not suggesting that we get rid of our red bud. I am suggesting that that's not the only thing we can and we certainly shouldn't go out of our way to get rid of number two on the list. If we keep some, some native prunus around, these are the insects that are going to come into your life. And this becomes part of the aesthetic of those plants. Now, if we're going to think about what plants do, again, we don't have to give up what they look like. But this becomes part of the aesthetic. It's part of the beauty that will be, be associated with that plant if it's in your yard. This is the cecropia moth and its larvae. Black cherry is their favorite host plant. Uh, tiger swallowtail. You know, we're all planting butterfly gardens these days, and what do we do? We put in nectar plants and hope that we attract butterflies from someplace else, as if butterflies materialize out of, out of thin air. Butterflies, of course, come from larval host plants, and if you want butterflies in your butterfly garden, I suggest you put the larval host plant in your butterfly garden, and the favorite larval host plant for tiger swallowtail is black cherry. And that's what the larva looks like. If you have black cherry, you can have the isle moth and its beautiful larvae. You can have the coral hair streak, the paddle caterpillar. You can have the red spotted purple, which is a specialist on, on black cherry, and it's larva that looks like bird dung. You can have the promethean moth and its beautiful larvae, the purple crested slug, the crocus geometer, the spotted acatalite, the saddleback caterpillar. You can have the white furcula, the spiny rose caterpillar. You can have the lunate jelly. Who would not want the lunate jelly? or the yellow-haired dagger moth, or nation slug, or 400 and some odd other species of caterpillars, other species of bird food, if you keep some black cherry in your yard. You know, an alternative to black cherry, another native uh, prunus is American plum. Here it is in, in bloom on the edge of a, of a woodlot. Uh, it's also a good way to shrink your lawn because it's so inefficient. It sends up a little grove of these things. They might want to consider that. And it's, it's a really important plant for early spring native bees. They're all over that thing where they can grow. What about an oak? If you put an oak in your yard, you can have the push caterpillar. You can have the polyphemus moth, the buck moth, the white marked perfect moth, the saddle prominent, double light prominent, white dotted prominent. You can have the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the lace cap caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the smaller terrassa. You can have the unicorn caterpillar, or the crown slug, or the hide moth. Think it's a parental. You can have the street dagger moth, the red punk oak worm, the confused wood grain, or the spun glass slug, which I think is the coolest caterpillar in North America. You know where I took all these pictures? You're supposed to say, your backyard. That's what everybody says. <laughs> no, I took them in my front yard. You're allowed to have productive plants in your front yard. No more backyard habitat. We're talking about the whole yard. And you know what? That's what my front yard looked like 10 years ago when we built the house. This area was mowed for hay. There was nothing there. That's what it looked like from the same perspective last year. We do have some lawn up front. We're very traditional. That's a chestnut oak. I planted it from an acorn. It's not 300 years old. I hear landscapers tell, tell people, do not plant an oak. You won't live long enough to enjoy it. I am enjoying that. And so are all the things I just showed you that we're, we're eating oak. But if you want instant gratification, don't call it an oak tree, call it an oak bush, and you've got it. 
and that's that's what it looked like from from my house. Um, that area is standing up in here. We do have our lawn down here. We really do in the fall. Uh, and it's, you know, I'm an entomologist, and if I'm doing entomological restoration, this is this is the pinnacle which we achieved last summer. That's the hickory horn devil. That's the largest caterpillar in North America, about seven inches long. It has already disappeared from New England. It's on the ropes, and we brought it to our house. I never thought we could do it, but there we go. There it was. Uh, you know, people wonder why I have the nerve to, to suggest that they turn their favorite garden plants into into caterpillar factories. But I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting thinking about your entire landscape and thinking about turning it into bird food factories. And then it's not so bad. 79 million people put out bird food every year or every winter because they care about the birds. They want to feed them. And then during the summer, they starve the birds by the way they, they landscape. So once the, that connection is made between the plants in your yard and bird food, uh, all of a sudden it's not so bad. So what does a, a biodiversity friendly suburb look like? This is the most important thing we need to do. We need to build biological corridors that connect those isolated habitat fragments I was talking about earlier. If we do that, those isolated habitat fragments won't be isolated anymore. And if they're not isolated anymore, their populations of animals within them won't be tiny anymore. And if they're not tiny anymore, when they fluctuate normally, they will not disappear. This is the single most important thing we can do to end that extinction crisis right away. We, of course, we need to use the plants that are going to support the food webs that we're talking about. And I suggest that, that those biological carters go in the area that is now in lawn, because we don't need 45.6 million acres of lawn. Lawn is the second least productive thing we can do with the landscape. The first least productive thing is paving it over. So let's look at the landscaping uh, paradigm that we followed for, for the last century. What we've done is build our house and design our little flower bed, plant a tree here, there, there, and everything by default after that becomes lawn. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build our house, then carve out the area where we want to have lawn. Where do we want lawn? We want lawn where we're going to walk. Lawn is the perfect space. It's a perfect plant for walking on. You can walk on grass without killing it. You also should pick flat areas. That'll be easy for you guys here. Um, because you don't, you don't want a lawn on a slopey area. Those are hard to mow and, and it doesn't hold the water at all. So where do you want lawn? Let's say you, you, you want your wedding in the front yard, your lawn there. You want to walk to the backyard, you need a grass patch, you want to throw the frizzy back here. Wherever you want lawn, go for it. But when you're through defining where you're going to walk, everything else by default becomes heavily planned. And that becomes the design challenge of our time. Because how do we get all those plants into our landscapes without them looking messy and wild? I get it that people don't like messy and wild, but we can do that. We can make these neat manicured landscapes with a lot of vegetation in them and have them highly productive all at the same time. But that's a different lesson. If we do that in half the area that is now in lawn, let's say 20 million acres. If we've got 40 million acres in lawn, we take half of that and put it in, in uh, biological targets. We can create a new national park. We'll call it Suburban National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Gethsemane, plus the Grand Teton, plus Canyonlands, plus Mount Rainier, North Cascade, Badlands, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. If you add all those spaces up, it's still less than, than 20 million acres. So our new our suburban national park is going to be huge. Let's do it. Let's take areas that look like this and turn them into that. Let's turn this into that, into that, no, this, into that, into that, into that. This, we call this the, the Lepidoptera Trail at the University of Delaware. We call it the Lepidoptera Trail instead of the Butterfly Garden because it supports all the Lepidoptera, the moths too. We've got little grass paths that line throughout that the public comes and looks at it. I show you this picture for two reasons. I have heard time and again, you cannot make a native plant garden this pretty. I think that's okay. But even if you don't think that's pretty, um, here's the main point. A year before I took this picture, that was long. So it doesn't take half a lifetime to do this. Or you can go whole hog and make a woodland path in your backyard. This could be the edge of your property. Um, these are now all plants that are appropriate for a woodland setting. No more lawn. You know, you're not mowing your lawn in your backyard anymore. And your neighbor doesn't care because he can't see you. This curves around and disappears. It looks like you own land forever. It looks like you're Ted Turner. 
And if you convince your neighbor to do the same thing, then you've got that connectivity that I'm talking about. You've got those biological targets that will connect with the woodland at the end of the street here and, and, and down here um, so that plants and animals can move freely through our suburban spaces. Here's just, uh, you know, this is something I took the other day when I was flying. Um, this is the forest that was cut in half by, by this development here. But if we put the plants back into that development, we still have the connectivity that we want to have, at least on some level. Now, here's there's something we need to think about when we're building our, our, our biological targets. Here's a house that, that um, was put into this forest without cutting the trees down. That's a good first step. Notice that is a tulip tree monoculture. Every tree there is, is a tulip tree, so we might want to diversify that a little bit. Uh, so good first step, but then the homeowner has gone and, and done what we do everywhere, mowed under every tree. Why do they mow under every tree? Because they like short grass. Why do they like short grass? Because humans like short grass. Why do humans like short grass? That's what evolutionary psychologists have been thinking about that. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense. So they've got, they've got a couple of hypotheses. And the one they like the best is, is that uh, we spend a lot of time in Africa. And every time we went into tall grass or bushy scrub, we didn't come out. <laughs> so only people that like short grass were the ones that left Africa. But you know, it makes sense. We like short vegetation so we can see our enemies. After we left Africa, we didn't have to worry about the lion anymore, but we still worried about our neighbors. We wanted to see them coming. But not in our, our biological targets. We need the canopy, we need the subcanopy, we need the understory, we need the shrub layer, and we need healthy forest flora. Because each part, each of those strata support uh, important parts of the biodiversity that ought to be there. We want to put the tallest trees in the middle, heavily interplanted by, by understory trees, heavily interplanted by shrubs. If we make our, our biological targets and find out that they're all mulch, we don't have enough plants. We're not making mulch gardens. Then we can be creative with our, our, our flowering plants, our perennials, and our, and our um, annuals in the sunny edges of our, our target. We can favor particular plants that do what we want in terms of bringing nature into our lives. And this is just an example that works at, at my house. This is alternately dogwood, cornice alternifolia. Beautiful bloom in the spring, uh, produces lots of nice insects when the birds are reproducing. Uh, but then those, those flowers turn into a wonderful berry set in mid-July, mid end of July, and the same birds come back to eat those berries. I put this particular tree next to my bathroom window. It has grown up past the bathroom window. So now when I look out that window, I, I, it's right there. And any bird that comes to that plant, I get to see. And so many birds have come to that particular plant. But I started to keep a, a, a photographic record of each of the species um, just to see what's there. I've missed some, but this is what I have so far. Baltimore Oreo female, uh, Orchard Oreo female. Peter Waxling, Cat Bird, Bluebird Mummy, Bluebird Baby, Brown Thresher. Uh, Mockingbird came in to get the berries, but so found insects, so they're always taking insects. Warbling Vireo, uh, Peewee, Red Eyed Vireo, Robin, Hungry Cat Bird, Tinder, sorry, and a Ruby Crown King, which is not there to eat the berries, it's just there to eat the insects that are on those leaves. And every January, my wife and I do a study abroad trip. In Costa Rica, we take 12 kids down and spend a month there, and we run into birding groups all month long. People who pay big bucks to go see these birds. I just have to go to the bathroom. And I can see if I don't want to do my birding from the bathroom, I look at the bedroom window at our elderberry, and I get the same cast of characters. But these plants in our biological parts are going to make leaves, and those leaves fall to the ground, and then we all freak out. We get our rake. We get our leaf blowers, we've got to get those leaves out. We stuff them in garbage bags, put them out for the trash man as if they were trash. Then we run to Home Depot and we buy we buy mulch. We buy fertilizer. We buy hoses. We buy all the all the ecosystem services that we just threw out. Except we can't buy the arthropods that live in those leaves. Why do we do that? Well, you know, we gotta get rid of the, the, the leaves before they hurt our lawn. And what if one of those leaves blew onto our neighbor's yard? That would be bad news. But look, we can anchor them with a fern garden. Now, this is an oak tree here. Those are the oak leaves that fall. I know this guy, he didn't plant any of those ferns. He simply created the perfect medium for a fern garden, and now they're all held in place. You can formalize this planting with a, a grass path that convinces your neighbors that, that uh, it's intentional, that you haven't moved out. 
but you really are landscaping. But what you've really done is create the perfect foraging site for all of our stresses. Our stresses are disappearing because they forage in leaf litter and we are throwing the leaf litter away. If we put it back, I maintain that they don't need deep forests, they just need something to eat. Our ovenbirds, why are they called ovenbirds? Because they make their nests out of leaves that look like little ovens on the ground. They forage on the ground. Kentucky warblers, hooded warblers, all forage on the ground. We've got to stop throwing away their food. Here's something that all birds do. They make eggs. And those eggs are made of, of calcium. Where do birds get their calcium? I'll give you a hint. They don't drink milk. Well, I didn't know where they got their calcium. It turns out they're getting most of their calcium from the, the shells of little land snails. And those little land snails are on the leaf litter. So birds, even birds that spend most of their life in the canopy will come to the forest floor to eat the, the shells of land snails when they're reproducing. Those are the same snails that we just threw out with, with our, our leaves. So let's give our birds a break by keeping some leaf litter out. I hear all the time, where I have our, our fireflies going? Well, that's an adult firefly, but the larvae look like that, and the larvae live in leaf litter that we just threw out. You don't have fireflies where you have chemlons. So if you want your kids to have that traditional early summer experience chasing the fireflies, you've got to keep some leaf litter around. Okay. All I'm saying is that nature is, is what we make of it these days. We can make a lot of it or a little of it depending on how we landscape. And more and more people are, are uh, using more natives. Some landscapers are landscaping entirely with natives, and this, this is a one. A guy by the name of, of Larry Weiner uh, up in the uh, Philadelphia and Connecticut area has been doing this for 20 years. When I met Larry about five years ago, I was excited because it allowed me to be able to go to the houses that he has landscaped, measure the biodiversity, and compare it to traditional landscapes, and see whether anything I just told you is, is real. Uh, and when I say me, I really mean Karen Burkhardt is the student I talked into doing this. She was happy. And she compared six Larry Wiener landscapes, landscapes with six traditional landscapes that were uh, very nearby. She controlled for everything, the size of the house footprint, the size of the landscape, the, the proximity to, to woodlot, um, everything, including the amount of, of plant material on both sets of landscapes. That's a traditional landscape, by the way. So she wasn't comparing bare lawn with a forest. Both the traditional and the Larry Wiener landscapes had the same amount of plants. The only thing that differed was the percentage of native plants on these landscapes. And she measured uh, caterpillars and breeding birds. She found significantly more caterpillars on those native properties, more species of caterpillars. She found more birds, more species of birds. There were some birds on the traditional properties. And when she looked at what they were, she found that they were house sparrows, house finches, pigeons, starlings, invasive birds that do really well with humans. When she took those out of the data set and only focused on the birds of conservation concern in the area where Karen did this study, she got the biggest difference of all, which means the birds that needed to help the most responded the most to these types of, of, uh, of native landscapes. That's really good news to me. The only thing that's really good news to me is that the native landscapes that she looked at were really young. They had only been landscaped within the last three years, which meant that all of the, 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 the biodiversity that she measured on those properties came quickly. And this is important because we're a society of instant gratification. If it took 50 years for these things to colonize new landscapes, nobody would bother to do it. But it doesn't. It happens right away. I'm thinking about a, a concept that, that you know, based on carbon credits, we hear we're going to get carbon credits. How about native credits? Let's say you really have to have that, that uh, crepe myrtle in your yard. That's going to cost you two oaks. And that would balance out the fact that your crepe myrtle is not producing anything for the wildlife. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll develop that a little, a little bit more. Okay, last thing I want to talk about quickly is, is what people tend to worry about the most. If you put all these native plants in your, your garden, and all these insects I'm talking about come to your garden and eat those plants, your plants are going to be full of holes or defoliated. But that's, that's not what I think is going to happen. What I'm suggesting we do is rebuild the balanced ecological community 
the balanced food web that used to be in our suburban spaces. And if we do that, our plants will not be any more defoliated than the typical forest uh, plants that we see when we drive, drive by. Here's an example. This is a tobacco hornworm. It was eating one of my tomato plants, and when I have to take its picture, uh, and it's all these white cocoons on its back. Those cocoons are from a parasitoid in the family Draconidae, a little wasp, and the larvae of which have tunneled out the inside of that caterpillar. So this guy is alive, but he's dead. He's not going to eat any more tomato plants. He's not going to, to uh, make any more tobacco hornworms. So they have essentially controlled this garden pest. This is a little caramelid wasp that is laying eggs in the Braconica thing. So the caramelid is making sure we don't have too many Braconids at our house. The Braconid is making sure that we don't have too many tobacco hornworms. And the tobacco hornworms is making sure we don't have too many tomatoes. So that's a garden in balance. Where do we where do we get these natural enemies when some people don't don't have them? Well, there's two possibilities. Either we have so many tobacco hornworms that are there all summer long to provide food for these guys, because natural enemies need something to eat. If you don't have something to eat, they will leave. So I thought about that. Do we have so many of these? No. In the ten years we've been there, that's the only one I've seen. And he's dead. So who is the, supporting all of these these Draconids and, and Caramelids? Well, this is a type of sphinx moth, and it turns out we have 13 species of sphinx moths at our house because we've got the host plants that support 13 species of sphinx moths. Sphinx moths like the Pandora sphinx. I have Pandora sphinx because it eats Virginia creeper. I have Virginia creeper on my back porch because I planted it on my back porch. People say, are you crazy? No, I planted it on my back porch because I wanted the adult moth to come lay an egg there so I could take a picture of its beautiful larva. And it worked. They come in this color, whatever that is. They come in yellow, and they come in green. And they also come covered with the tonic thing. People say, it's a big caterpillar. Say, aren't you afraid it's going to defoliate your Virginia creeper? No, I'm not. Virginia creeper grows really fast. And in the 10 years that, that I've been looking, we have only found these three. Why is it being so rare at my house? Well, look at all the things that are killing them. It's very difficult to reach maturity at my house. We also have... We have other types of predators. This is an assassin bug eating the fall webworm up north. We have big problems with fall webworms lately. These guys are doing their best to control them all summer long. And we've got all those breeding birds. A pair of bluebirds will eat up to 300 caterpillars a day, bring back 300 caterpillars a day to the nest when they're feeding their young. And they're not special. All the, all the birds will do that. So the more species of breeding birds and the more pairs of breeding birds you have in your property, the less of a chance of having an insect outbreak. We did go back to those, those uh, uh, properties that we measured before, though, uh, and measured the damage from insects, from sucking insects or from can, uh, chewing insects. This is a percentage of leaves damage. And look, after two years of studying the damage, there was actually less damage on the native properties compared to the traditional properties. This is the 10% uh, damage level. It's called the aesthetic injury level. Other studies have shown that, that homeowners don't even notice insect damage until about 10% of the leaves are damaged. So both these types of landscapings are well under the, the radar screen of, of these homeowners. These homeowners would say, we don't have any insects. When in fact, in these properties, they have thriving communities of both the herbivores and all those natural enemies that are eating them before they become big, become big enough to make any noticeable damage on the plants. And that's why I can look across to my other neighbor's house and see a woodlot that is not defoliated. Sure, there's little bits of each leaf that are eaten, but you can't see that. You can't notice. This is a, 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 a little habitat that is in ecological balance. So this is a, 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 a grassroots approach to conservation that I'm excited about for exactly that reason. It's something we all can do by ourselves. We don't have to get the government involved, which is great because they're really busy these days. We don't have to send our money to Brazil anymore to save the rainforest. We well, can do that. It's a very nice idea, and Brazil's taking our money, uh, but they're still cutting down the rainforest very quickly. Let's do some conservation right in the good old temperate zone. And when we do that, we can see the results. You put these plants in your yard, you will see the things that come to them. And that becomes motivation to do it again. There are so few environmental issues that a single person can address and actually see the results of. But this is one of them. If we want to put nature back in the lives of our kids, no better way to do it than to put it right where they live. This little girl is, is four years old in this picture. And the reason 
she could play in this meadow because it's 15 feet from her back porch. She didn't need a class trip to do it. The reason she wants to play in this meadow is because it's interesting. If that was no turf, and it was no turf at one point, she'd be inside learning how to, to plug something in her ear. So somebody once said the garden is a way of showing that you believe in tomorrow, and I think that's never been more true than right now. Because the way we garden today, the way we landscape today, is going to determine what life looks like tomorrow. Thank you very much.